Heavenly Father, we want to see um, this world um, through the lens of you, through the lens of your word. We want to see ourselves rightly in light of what you have revealed. We want to see our need for a Savior in light of what you have said about us and who you are as our Savior. God, help us as we, as a church family, study your word and open up your Bible. Lord, may May you be our vision. May you be what we set our sights on and what we see by as we live in this world that is in rebellion against you, as we run behind enemy lines even this week with the gospel, offering a pardon to all rebels like us, like we once were. May we offer that pardon until the day you come, until our last breath. Lord, you are worthy of that. You should be glorified at every point. Sinners should trust in you. You are to be glorified. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And let's take out our Bibles this morning and turn once again to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're working our way through this amazing missionary support letter from Paul to the church in Rome. He is aiming to get to Spain And he wants to establish the Romans in the gospel. And then he wants to endear them to his gospel mission and the expansion of the gospel as he heads to Spain. And he's going to make a very methodical case for the gospel. I want to start with maybe a series of questions this morning for you to think about. We asked some of them last week, but I want you to think about some of these questions as we begin. How well do you know yourself? How well do you know yourself? What do you think is wrong with you? Do you think anything is wrong with you? Do you think there's a little bit wrong with you? Do you think everything is wrong with you? What do you think the solution is to what you think is wrong with you? Remember last week we said how you answer that question says an awful lot about what you think about salvation is and what kind of power it takes to make the correction. How lost are you? Here's another set of questions. How holy is God? How bad is sin? How angry at sin and sinners is God? You need to have answers to these questions. How much has your sin incapacitated you before God? Here's another one that gets asked a lot or thought about a lot. Do you think you'll go to heaven? I don't know if you've ever thought to ask yourself this question, but do you know what heaven presently thinks of you? Look at Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. The righteousness of God, we found out last week, is given only on the basis of faith. Righteousness is not given on the basis of good works that we try to do. So here's another little set of questions. Why? Why is righteousness given only on the basis of faith and not on the basis of works? Why? Why would the gospel say, God declares a status of righteousness over only the one who believes and who does not work for it? Why would the gospel say that? What does that say about our works that we think we can offer to God? 
Why does the gospel reveal the declared righteousness of God given on the basis of faith alone? Because what we are in ourselves is so, so bad, so ruined, and so condemned by God. What we are is so offensive to him. The reason righteousness cannot come from us is, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Man is under the present wrath of God and he has no other way to attain the righteousness of God in salvation except on the basis of faith alone. Verses 18 to the end of chapter 1. This section is the proof of that. Let me read it to you. I'm going to read from 18 to 23. That's going to be the passage we'll cover today. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Listen, man is in such a precarious and perilous condition before God that he is completely incapable of anything good or acceptable to God. In fact, he can only do evil toward God, as you'll see, and as we just read. So salvation will have to come from some other place than from us. Man will have to look away from himself and trust in God alone for the righteousness that God accepts, but that man does not have. This passage is an extremely dark assessment of you and of me, of mankind. This passage is not like God telling you that um, you have bad breath and you need a breath mint. Romans 1, 18 to 32 is rather something like God pumping the stomach of humanity and pouring it out all over the table on the examination table, to reveal what we've all been overdosing on, to forget him and to ruin ourselves. It is ugly. It is gruesome. It is offensive to God. These are fearful realities. And until you see God's wrathful response to what we've become, what you've become and made of yourself, you won't be concerned for salvation. You won't be concerned about his righteousness. You won't be concerned to look away from yourself and put your faith in God. Until you come face to face with these three fearful realities regarding God's wrath against you, you won't be concerned for any of these things. What is this passage all about? I'll put it for you up on the screen here. Before the gospel saves, it must make man face three fearful realities regarding God's wrath. I'm going to give them all three to you. We're only going to cover two today. But I want to ask you, will you humbly face these realities? Will you honestly face them? Number one, the wrath of God revealed. Number two, the wrath of God deserved. 
And then, Lord willing, next week we'll cover the wrath of God inflicted. The first fearful reality that you must face if you're going to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. Number one, the wrath of God revealed, verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed. And again, this is the explanation for why declared righteousness of God, the declared righteousness of God, is on the basis of faith only. It is your only hope for being saved. Why is the gospel revealing the righteousness of God? Because right now, God's wrath is being revealed against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How can such unrighteous men produce in themselves the righteousness that God would accept in salvation? The only way God's wrath will be stopped is if he sees what? His righteousness, not yours, not mine, his. And Romans 1.18 says his wrath is revealed presently. Now, will God's wrath one day on the day of wrath be revealed or poured out on all of God's enemies? And the answer is yes. But that future day of wrath does not mean that there is no present wrath being inflicted on God's enemies. And because there is present-day wrath being spoken about here continuously and in being inflicted on man, it doesn't mean that there's no future day of wrath coming. Both statements concerning God's wrath are made in Scripture, and both of them stand in complement to one another, not in competition against one another. Maybe what could be said is that the holy hangman, who will hang all of his enemies one day, is giving them today more rope. Notice with me first the source of wrath, Romans 1.18. It is the wrath of God from heaven. That means this is a wrath or an anger unlike anything that comes from you or that can be expressed in or on this earth. It is not a capricious anger. It is not irrational anger. It is not indiscriminate anger. There is no collateral damage expressed like when we get angry and other people get uh, hit with our anger who don't deserve it. It is not uncontrolled fury like man's wrath. This wrath of God from heaven is holy wrath, pure wrath, clean wrath, settled wrath. It is focused, directed anger. It is perfect anger. It is controlled. It is just anger. It is right anger because it belongs to God who is on his holy throne in a holy place called heaven. It is his majestic, heavenly, sacred aversion and revulsion and objection and punitive justice against everything that is not his righteousness. He is not indifferent towards sin. He is wrathful right now against sin. He's not a spectator watching sin on a field play. He's not a journalist taking notes of what he's watching as he sees sin out there. God is a present and active judge with a gavel in his hand who is slamming it down repeatedly in perfect anger, just condemnation, and with every sentence passed, every moment, every minute of every day from his courtroom in heaven. I want to ask you this question again. Do you think you're going to heaven? You've got to ask this better question first. Do you know what heaven thinks of you right now? Do you know? Listen, God is not in some dumpy little shack in the woods inviting good people to think again about the problem of evil in the world. God is on a majestic throne, his majestic throne in heaven, and right now he is inflicting holy wrath. You say, but how right now? Look just, we'll look at this, Lord willing, next week. Look at verse 24. In this sense, he's inflicting wrath. God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's not good. 
if you or I are going to go to heaven, listen, heaven needs to be persuaded otherwise concerning us. What could persuade heaven? This, God's righteousness that comes on the basis of faith alone. You must look away from yourself and plead with God to give you what will change heaven's mind about you. Notice, secondly, with me, the objects of wrath. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The word ungodliness means it's an attack on God personally. It's an attack on God's godness. It's an attack on his majesty as God. It, it is to be against the very being of God. It is against his worthiness as God. That's ungodly to do that. And unrighteousness is to be arrayed against his holy will and wants. Uh, to be against what he says is right. So ungodliness is to be personally on the attack against God's personhood, and to be unrighteous is to be opposed to his will and the rightness that he wants. It's probably best not to see these as two separate sins that are being mentioned, but rather both of those present in every single sin we commit. In every sin that I commit, I'm, I'm opposed to God and to his majesty as God. I am ungodly in that sin. And then, therefore, I am unavoidably against the right thing that he wants. I'm unrighteous. And God is revealing his wrath not against some of that. He, he's not revealing his wrath regionally you know, from heaven against all of the Muslim world of ungodliness and unrighteousness. He's not revealing his wrath from heaven against the Hinduistic ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He's not revealing his wrath from heaven against the secular, humanistic, European ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He's not revealing it only over here in our post-Christian West ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. But God is revealing from heaven... His wrath against all expressions of ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, no matter where they are, no matter who they are. God can see it all from heaven. What can't he see from heaven? There's no exceptions. And lastly, notice with me the truth in wrath. Number three, the truth in wrath. At the end of this devastating sentence, you might, your eye might catch the word truth at the end of verse 18, and you might be tempted quickly in seeing that word to think, thank God. Thank God. In the midst of all that deluge of wrath from heaven, at least there's some truth going out, going forth about God, maybe about his world, about man, about a relationship with God. Thank God there's truth. Ah, but notice what you and I have done with the truth. Verse 18, we are men and women and boys and girls who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In unrighteousness. In our unrighteousness, the fact that we oppose the right and the good that God wants, we render ourselves unable to handle truth appropriately. You've heard it said you can't handle the truth. You can't handle appropriately the truth because you suppress it. To suppress the truth presupposes that truth exists and that it is exerting itself. It is stretching itself forward. It is extending itself to every man in every direction, and we suppress it. That means we try to hold it down. We try to restrain its extension. We try to prevent it from stretching, reaching its goal. We try to drown out its voice with other noises. We thwart the truth. We stifle the truth, and that all presupposes that we grasped what it was saying, and we didn't like it. Ungodliness and unrighteousness infects every square inch of what we all are, and in that condition, truth approached us, and we understood its message and its contents, and then we put our fingers around the neck of it, and we tried to suffocate it, and God in heaven sees it all. 
And he has not waited to respond, but he has been responding. He continues to respond in his holy revulsion against sin. Wrath is revealed, and that is a fearful reality to face. I want you to think carefully with me. What does this mean about man supposedly being a seeker? Are there any who genuinely seek for God? Well, I hope Romans 1.18 is enough to confirm that that's not what we do. But if you have any doubt, just turn a page and look over at Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Are there any? Are there any who, when the truth approaches them, they go, oh, I really need to be objective here. I should really be unbiased and assess its message. I should give its message a shot. There's nobody who does this. If this is what we do with God's truth, salvation will never cross our minds because only suppression crosses our minds. Salvation will never come from us. Or if we do come up with some sham version of salvation, it will only be from our assault on God's truth. It will be a perversion of God's truth, the result of us trying to choke out God's truth. Can you imagine us trying to be religious and, exp- and, and impress God while we're choking his truth? God, look at me. Do you see what I do? I got something to offer you with my good works. Don't look over here. I'm trying to kill your truth. What on earth is that? Any God who would accept that version of salvation is not a God worth knowing. In fact, that God doesn't exist, except maybe in a shack in the woods. The first fearful reality regarding God's wrath is the wrath is revealed. The second fearful reality that you must face if you're going to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, the wrath of God deserved. Verses 19 to 23, Paul makes the case that wrath is deserved here in these verses. Uh, From uh, chapter 1, verse 18, he made the point in our suppression of the truth, but now that must be expanded on. And so Paul's going to do that in two ways. Um, That wrath is deserved, is proven by these two things. First, I'll just give you these uh, up front, and then we'll take them one at a time. God's wrath is deserved, is proven first by three inexcusable evidences. In verses 19 and 20. And then it is proven by six indefensible offenses. In verses 21 to 23. Let's consider first these three inexcusable evidences that prove that God's wrath against us is deserved. I'm going to give you the first two together because they're practically impossible to separate. Look at verse 19. I'm just going to give you the the, the main statements. That which is known about God is evident within them. Look at the next statement in verse 19. God made it evident to them. God has determined that there is some knowableness of him in this world, and this is what God makes evident to us. So first, the fact is stated, verse 19, that which is known about God is evident within them. And then Paul explains how it is evident. For God made it evident to them. Where is, the evident, where is this made evident to us? Internally. Within them. Within us. In us. Inside ungodly and unrighteous men, God made what is known about him evident there. What can be known about God? is not merely evident um, over there someplace in a book that I haven't read yet, but it's made evident inside each one of us. What can be known about God is evident there. Again, how? Because, verse 19, God did it. He just made what can be known about him evident to us. And when God makes something evident, there's no doubt whether it is evident or not. The reason we know God inwardly is because he made himself in some degree 
evident to us. That means that God was not content to just leave you to the discovery process. He stepped in and made it evident. He actively made what can be known about him evident to us, and therefore it is evident within us. And so this is the truth that we suppress in our ungodliness and in our unrighteousness that was stated in verse 18. We suppress what God made known about him to us. And then Paul then expands on these first two evidences against us. What did he make known? Number three, the third inexcusable evidence, God's eternal power and divine nature. They've been clearly seen. Verse 20 starts with the word for. That means it's the further explanation of how God made what is knowable about himself evident to us. How? Well, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, and he tells us which ones he's thinking of, his eternal power and his divine nature, they have been clearly seen through what has been made. Maybe the way to say this in summary form is the invisible creator is visible through creation. From the time of creation onward, God has been making himself known through what he has made. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. Psalm 19. And notice that what has been... uh, Notice that what he has been making known... um, or that is clearly seen is not just the fact that he exists. That there is a God. Oh, much, much more is being revealed. But that his everlasting power and all of his attributes or qualities that make him divine, those are clearly seen. So we, the ungodly and unrighteousness, we, we, and unrighteous, we look out on creation. And do you know what we clearly see? We see God is powerful. He is powerful with an everlasting power. And we know this was all made or it had to come about by a power that never runs out. We know that clearly, verse 20. But we suppress it. We suppress it. We put our hands around the neck of that clarity and we try to choke it to death because we are ungodly and we are unrighteous. Listen, evolution is our suppression of truth. And we, the ungodly and unrighteous, when we look out on creation, we clearly see that God is God. He's divine. He's not a part of creation, but he is divinely different from it. He's different above it. He's different before it. And that has been clearly seen by us, verse 20. And neither of those clarities about God are up for debate. They're clearly seen. But we just put our hands around the neck of that and we try to choke it out. In what sense have they been clearly seen? Verse 20, look at it with me. Being understood through that which has been made. Oh, We understood it with our minds. That is what is meant by clearly seeing it. We we see this truth about God with our mind's eye of understanding. And that is how what is known about God is evident within us. We have seen it in the sense that we understand it in our minds. We have understood internally what we have clearly seen in creation about God. What if you can't see? What if your physical eyes can't see? What if you um, can't hear? What if you can't speak? There once was a little girl who was that way. Her name is Helen Keller. A disease left Helen Keller as a very young girl without sight, hearing, and speech. Through Ann Sullivan's tireless and selfless efforts, Helen finally learned to communicate through touch and even learned to talk. When Miss Sullivan first tried to tell Helen about God, the girl's response was that she already knew about him. She just didn't know his name. It's purely anecdotal. But listen, here's what you need to understand. We understand this about God, not because we have physical eyes. We understand because God made it evident. 
within us. And the result of this clear communication is so that we would be saved? No. So that we are without excuse. In our suppression of this truth about God, we are without excuse. These three evidence um, have us without excuse before God, the God of wrath. That which is known about God is evident within us. Number two, God made it evident to us. Number three, how? Well, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen through what has been made. And we put our hands around the throat of all of that truth and all of that knowledge and all that evidence, and we try to squeeze the life out of it. We're clearly without excuse before God. I want to ask you again, what do you think is wrong with you? Do you merely need self-improvement on the basis of this? Or do you need salvation? What kind of power, can you think of this already? What kind of power is needed to change this? Theologians call what is going on in verse 20, um, this revelation of God in creation, they call it natural revelation as uh, opposed or in contrast to, not opposed to, but in contrast to the special revelation that God's word is to man. And this is what God reveals of himself to ungodly and unrighteous men apart from his Bible. What's going on in verse 20 here? This is what he reveals to us through creation. And we, with this natural revelation from creation, we know God internally. But we suppress this truth, we suppress this knowledge of him. And this natural revelation, therefore, is not a source of hope for us. It is a source of condemnation against us. It makes us without excuse before the God of wrath, and we, we deserve the wrath of God. But, but you say, what, what, about the, what about the tribal people of Mariroro? What about them? They've never heard the gospel yet. We're taking so long to get the the gospel into their language. Are they neutral toward God? Are they as a people undecided about God? Are they a blank slate before him? Well, what does this say? You know what it says? That they're just like me. They're just like you. They too are ungodly and unrighteous, and they are suppressors of the truth about God that they've understood internally. God made it evident to them like he's made it evident to me and to you through creation. There is no man, there is no woman, there is no boy, there is no girl who is a blank slate, who's undecided. The tribal people of Mari Roro, you know what they're like? They're just like the people of Spain that Paul had on his mind as he's writing the Romans. I gotta get there. I gotta get there. They will perish in their ungodliness and unrighteous suppression of the truth unless someone gets to them and preaches a righteousness that comes on the basis of faith alone. There are no true agnostics. There are no innocent men, women, boys, and girls anywhere on this planet. Evangelistically, we need to do it all, but we can't. But wherever God leads us, we need to give it our all. Wherever God has you, you need to give it your all. Three inexcusable evidences prove wrath is deserved, and it only gets worse. Let's talk about the six indefensible offenses in verses 21 to 23. What's spelled out here is the most horrible decline, fall, slide, collapse, downward spiral, stumbling descent imaginable. Look from the heights of where Paul begins in verse 21. He talks about honoring God, glorifying God, and look to the depths of where he ends in verse 23, images of crawling dust-licking, dirt-covered, mud-dwelling creatures, reptiles. 
that massive free fall from God and honoring of God all the way down to an image of a dirty reptile, that happens not to men and women and boys and girls who just didn't know better. It happens to those who knew God. Look at verse 21. Even though they knew him, they did this. They plummeted in the most corrupt and despicable and blasphemous practice imaginable. These are the six indefensible offenses of man against God. Why are they indefensible? Because man knows God. Man knows him through creation. The truth exerted itself toward us. God made himself evident to us, but we still jumped off the ledge and fell from him as far away and as fast away from him as we could. It's absolutely indefensible. The first one, the first indefensible offense is they did not honor God. Verse 21, even though we knew this eternal power of God and all of the divine qualities that qualify him as God, we didn't honor him as such. We knew what was due his name. We knew he should be honored. We knew he was a God with everlasting power and all the divine qualities that make him God. We knew he should be exalted as God, but we withheld from him the honor that was due him. That is absolutely indefensible. Wrath is deserved. I'm going to ask you again, what do you think is wrong with you? If this is how we are, Knowing what we know about God, how are you going to save yourself? How are you going to come up with anything that God would look at and say, that's, that's impressive? The second indefensible offense, number two, they did not thank God. Ungodly, unrighteous, truth suppressors, we, we keep breathing God's air and we keep eating his bread, and we keep drinking his water, and we bask in his sunshine, and we benefit from his rain that falls. And he is the source of all of our good that we have and all of the good that we enjoy, and we know it. We know him. We know we're indebted to his benevolence. We know we are enriched and sustained by him, but we bite his hand instead of giving thanks. Absolutely indefensible. Wrath is deserved. And I ask you, how angry do you think God is? What within you could possibly change this kind of life that is yours? Third indefensible offense, they became futile. Verse 21, even though they knew God, they became futile in their speculations. We received the truth, we were told. God made what is known about himself known to us. He made it evident to us. We understand him through what has been made. We have understanding, and we exercised our reasoning on all of that. We speculated on all of that, verse 21. And here is what happened to us. We became futile in our speculation. The word futile means we became destitute of anything solid or sure or meaningful, especially in regards to God. Can I ask you a question? What does that say then about your ability to reason with the evidence of God before you? What does that say about an evangelism strategy that relies solely on reasoning with sinners about what they see? Will they be reasonable? No. Listen, in evangelism, meet them at their reason that they're very impressed with, and you'll see that in a minute. Meet them where their reason is at, but run from their reason to the wrath of God that's being revealed against their reason. Run to the righteousness of God, and the minute they start talking about being rational, and rational people can't accept these things of God, you're like going, I know why you're doing that, and we got to turn to Romans chapter 1. Our ability to reason, our ability to speculate on what God has revealed about himself has only led us to be hostile against him. If my reasoning results in me becoming futile, how am I going to reason my way into salvation? How am I going to contribute to my salvation? 
This is an absolutely indefensible offense against God. Wrath is deserved. Again, what do you, what do you think is wrong with you? The fourth indefensible offense, their foolish heart was darkened, verse 21. Heart here is, in the Bible, is ne never a piece or a portion of you like your physical heart is a piece of you. And it's not the sentimental part of you where you just need to really put some heart into it. Your heart in Scripture is you. But it's who you are inwardly speaking. It is your inner self. It is your inner man or woman before God. So to say that your heart is foolish is to say that you are foolish at the inner you. And darkened. Darkened. That's an appropriate description at this point because we have had the light of truth, the light of creation communicating clearly the creator, but we keep trying to pour water on that candle of revelation and light. What can be at the heart level except spiritual darkness? I ask you again, how lost are you? How dark is your darkness? Well, now you know why. Here's why. Because you are in darkness at the very core of your inner person. And this is absolutely indefensible. It's offensive to God and wrath is deserved. The fifth indefensible offense, number five, they became fools, verse 22. They became fools. There's the main statement. They became fools, fools, but watch this, professing to be wise. The inward you is foolish at the heart level. Then it makes sense just to say, well, we became fools. But what is being said here in verse 22 that's different than what he just said at the end of verse 21 is that there is some self-deception and self-misevaluation that is fatally present. Man actually in becoming a fool, professes to be wise. That's what we do. We think we're being wise while we've got our hands around the throat of truth and the knowledge of God. And the Bible says we are actually fools. You know what this is like? This is like the king who's been deceived to think that he looks regal, he looks royal, he looks majestic as he has stripped down into his nakedness and marches in the parade. In his self-deception, he professes himself regal, majestic, all while everybody knows he's naked. Here's why you need help from outside of you to answer this question, what do you think is wrong with you? Because what will you do in answering that question in your own abilities? You will profess to be wise in your answer. And you need God's word to help you. You'll profess to be wise in your estimation of what you are, all the while God's word says, fool. Whose assessment of you are you going to believe? This is absolutely an indefensible offense. Wrath is deserved. The last indefensible offense, number six, they exchanged the glory of God. Verse 23 kind of summarizes the fall again, reminding us of how high we began with, look at the beginning of verse 23, the glory of the incorruptible God. And then at the verse, end of verse 23, it takes us even deeper down to the crawling creatures or the reptiles of the dust of the earth. What is meant here by the glory of the incorruptible God? It means the radiant splendor of God. That is his weightiness, his impressiveness. This is a way of summarizing all that God is. Glory is the word we use. This is his majestic impressiveness. Glory. He is glory. He is weighty. He is radiant, he is impressive, and he is imperishable. He is incorruptible. He has no shelf life. And then notice what that weighty, radiant glory is traded for, exchanged for, verse 23, an image, a reflection of sorts, a 
How do you compare the weightiness of God in a depiction, an image, a reflection of sorts? One, you can't hold because he's too massively impressive, and the other you can't hold because it's a depiction in your mind. The image is nothing in comparison. Man trades the incorruptible, glorious God for an image of anything, everything, corruptible, perishable, for anything that does have a shelf life. You know why? Because we wish God had a shelf life and would just die. The descent continues. It starts very high with man who is in the image of God to birds, and then down to the four-legged creatures like cattle, and then all the way to the dust-crawling reptiles. And the point here is not so much that we move from creator worship to creature worship. I think the point is this. It is the slanderous, blasphemous mockery of God that we've moved to. We knew that he is God, but we depict him. We caricature him in mockery. And then we cast our affections on that depiction and on that image. You know what this is like? This is like the the junior high boy who just got in trouble with teacher in class. And then he goes into the bathroom. And he sits in the dirty corner of a stall and he takes out his sharpie and he scribbles some distorted image of the teacher who just admonished him. Listen, the point of the image, the point of the depiction is mockery. And he loves the depiction. He hates the teacher. He would gladly exchange the teacher for that mockery that he inscribed on a wall. And that is us with God. That is man. And it doesn't matter if our images are of men or of birds or of cattle, of reptiles, or any other created thing. There is a huge exchange that has taken place from the glory of the incorruptible God, and it is a blasphemous mockery that is going on. So here is what we do in our suppression of the truth of God. We choose to trade his weighty and majestic and impressive glory for this going off into the darkness of our minds and hearts and scribbling there some kind of depiction of anything and everything that will be a mockery of the weighty glory of God. We trade him for some dirt-level, dust-worn, mud-scented image of a scaly reptile that dies. That's not merely creature worship. That's slanderous. It's blasphemous. It's mockery of God. Man doesn't want God, but will gladly mock him and cast his affections toward the grossest idea he can come up about him. You don't look at that descent of man, that free fall of man, and say, oh, bless their hearts for trying. You know what matters to God is that they're sincere in their worship. You don't say that. That's not what Romans 1 says. What that is, is a purposeful sinking to the lowest levels of sinfulness and mockery and blasphemy possible. And that is us. That's the human race. That's what we do with God. We are in that condition. And in that condition, what are we going to do to save ourselves? What could we do that God would see and say, you know, that was a helpful contribution? God won't take the foolish, mocking scribbling of him in our minds and put it on his fridge. God won't add a little bit of his power along with your power and save you. All of this means that the wrath of God is deserved. Six indefensible offenses prove it. 
Wrath is deserved also because of three inexcusable evidences in verses 19 and 20. Before the throne of God, think of this with me. Go there in your mind for just a moment. Before the throne of judgment one day, this is what will speak against you and me. Inexcusable evidences and indefensible offenses. God will say on that day to every man, every day before this judgment day, I was only revealing my wrath against you. It was deserved by you. And now that the day of judgment has come, why should I change my course of wrath that I've been on with you? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? And Paul's whole point is that because of this, because of this awful, fearful reality of God's wrath, this is why the gospel is preached and why the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that is declared on the basis of faith alone. Because you are so lost. I am so ruined. We are so rebellious. And God is so angry with us at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath that you and I have nothing within us. Nothing in us that will help us to change his wrathful disposition toward us. There is nothing in us that will help us prove to God that he is now obligated to save us by what we did. You have nothing within you. I have nothing within me that can merit his favor, that can change his disposition toward me. Your hope, your only hope, my only hope is to receive that which I don't have, but that which he will accept. And it's his righteousness. And he gives it only on the basis of faith alone in Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus. Look away from yourself. Believe that he suffered on the cross the just wrath that you have earned. Believe that it's sufficient to secure forgiveness of sin for you. The only thing that can change God's mind, that can change heaven's disposition towards you, is if he looks at you in all of your unrighteousness, but he sees his righteousness declared over you as a status. The only thing that stops the wrath of God is the righteousness of God. And you can't get it by anything you do. He gives it on the basis of faith alone. Do you believe Christ? Have you looked away from yourself and cast everything that you know of yourself on him? It's the only way. It is the only way. Let's pray. Lord, these are so terrifying words. And we remind ourselves of some other of your words that tell us about your mercy, that tell us about your grace. We remind ourselves of the words that we looked at last week. We we remind ourselves of the word gospel. Everywhere from heaven is raining down your wrath, but there's a place we can flee and get under. Oh God, it's your gospel. It's the good news of your son. We can take shelter under his cross where your wrath was poured out all on him. And we can look away from our sinfulness and our own unrighteous, dirty rags, and we can plead with you to help us to trust him. Give us the faith. Father, give it even here today to the one who maybe thought he or she was saved, was a Christian because in a Christian family, go to a Christian church. But they realize this has not happened. Oh God, give it. Give it wherever it is needed. Lord, what is our hope if, if you don't give in grace the faith? saves. 
the faith that is the basis for declared righteousness. Oh, God, be merciful. And Father, for those of us who have received that mercy and who do believe and have believed, Lord, would you help us to put our eyes back on the cross even as we sing and remember that there's no need for any fear or doubt. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.